host of this evening's uh, webinar. I've gone straight into host mode here. I'm not even sure if everybody is there, but for people that are there promptly, uh, it is seven o'clock. So, I mean, we're seven o'clock Irish time. There'll probably be a few there anyway. Um, you're all very welcome to the Emerald Business of Music seminar on crowdfunding and how to manage a successful campaign in association with Fundit. I'm going to introduce you to the panel in two seconds, but um, just to say, from my own point of view, I'm here broadcasting remotely, obviously, at this time. We do loads. People that attend IMRO seminars will know, will know me from those seminars. Um, I host and MC most of the seminars. This is our first one to do remotely. So, you know, uh, <laughs> into the great unknown. And it's brilliant to, to, be, to be doing this at this time. Fantastic to be connecting people. And I think it's a wonderful subject that we have tonight. Really timely. And um, I am really pleased as well to in that vein. I'll give you the big spiel when we start uh, later on, lads. But just uh, for now, I'll just say like two brilliant songwriters, um, two brilliant performers, and they've both recently had very successful funded campaigns. So I want to say hello to John Splan. How are you, John? Good evening to you. Good evening, everybody. Very, good, very well, thanks. I'm at home in my own house in Passage West, County Cork. What's it like down there this evening, John? It's been drizzling a bit all day, you know, it never rained heavily, but it just won't stop drizzling either. Right, okay, yeah, no, it's, it's a bit... soft day, thank God. Oh, exactly, well, look, it's, can't complain, no, it's a, bit, it's a bit sort of changeable here in Dublin as well, but uh, um, I'm, glad to hear, um, I'm glad to hear that it's not too wet down in, in the, the real capital, John, fair to say, is that, is, that, is that we're still going with that, are we? Ah, that's only not really, no. Dublin okay. is the capital of Ireland. You know, we're not really trying to be the capital at all. Okay. Um, and, and I also want to say hello to Luan Parle. Hi, how are you this evening, Luan? Hi, Paddy and everybody. I'm good, thank you. It's drizzly also in Kilkenny at the minute. <laughs> right. This is, a, this is a very Irish conversation so far. Let's get it's straight into <laughs> it, the weather. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm good, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and um, yeah, really looking forward to this. Yeah, and um, well, we've. Well, I think people are kind of as we as we speak now are gathering um, on the webinar, and uh, we very shortly uh, for anyone that's just joining, we'll be kicking off very shortly. We're going to kind of pay some respects to the uh, the ancient tradition of Irish time and say that we won't be ever starting sharp at seven o'clock. Um, but we will we will start shortly enough, um, and I'm very, very pleased as well to be joined by this evening the arts program manager at Fundit.ie. It's uh, Michelle Reed. Michelle, thanks very much for putting all this together and bringing everyone together. It's great to have this conversation. How are you this evening? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. Delighted to be here. Um, it's great to be joining up with Imro to do this crowdfunding webinar. I'm used to being in a room with people doing this. And um, so, yeah, it's a little bit different online, but um, delighted to be here and hopefully share some some tips and advice and um, answer any questions that people have and talk to the lovely Luanne and John and yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michelle, I should say, is a veteran of webinars. She's had um, which she won yesterday, so so she knows all about uh, the etiquette, and she'll be sort of at, at any stage just saying, "Well, you know, this is potentially where we'll go next, or whatever, whatever needs to be done." We will be taking questions from the floor, and if you're just logging in now, you'll probably be able to see. I see there's 36 participants, and I, I there's a Q and A button at the bottom. So at any stage, if you want to um, register a question, just pop it in there. We're going to take questions in two tranches. We're going to take first question after about you know 15 20 minutes and we'll take more questions at the end the, the webinar is going to run for an hour in total and look at i mean from obviously with this uh, kind of setup we're looking to get as much practical information as possible to learn as much about effective and successful crowdfunding and as as i said like we're absolutely delighted to have the panel that we have here now i will say to michelle what do you want to do? michelle will we, will we kick off with what we have or will we give people another few minutes to filter in <clears throat> um yeah i mean i i can sort of i can give an introduction to fund us um if, if you like and that 
maybe we'll it's a little bit of a blurb to get people off it's i think oh. it's fast now. okay okay well what i'll do then is um i'll i'll that sounds good to me um I have a little bit of a blurb here for you. And I know, as I said earlier on, you're too modest to toot your own trumpet. So we'll say that we'll be coming to John and Luan in, in a moment's time, um, who have completed uh, successful funded campaigns and are still ongoing. So let me just say that Michelle is the project manager of Funded.ie, an all-Ireland crowdfunding platform for creative projects, as well as driving the platform strategy. She moderates, guides, and supports hundreds of project creators throughout their crowdfunding campaigns every year. So Michelle, like, um, I suppose, tell us about Fundit. Um, I, I'm imagining that you guys are very busy at this time. Yeah, well, so Fundit's been around for nine years. It actually started um, as a project <clears throat> of the last recession, so around 2008. Um, we've been um, crowdfunding now at this stage. We've raised around, well, we haven't raised, our project creators have raised um, around 5 million euro for around 1,100 projects over the last nine years. So you can see that's a massive impact on the creative industry and the creative uh, sector in Ireland. Um, in, with regards to music specifically, so um, around over 1.3 million euro has been raised for music related projects on Fundus um, since we've been running nine years ago. So that kind of gives you an idea of kind of the impact that Fundus has. Um, essentially, it's about empowering people to connect with their own supporters, connect with their fans and give them the power to raise the funds that they need to um, do the project themselves. Um, so we're here and um, we have a team of crowdfunding experts, but also fundraising experts um, to guide people through from the very beginning of their submission right through to the very end in terms of delivering their rewards um, and any kind of, you know, any kind of struggles they might have throughout the campaign. There's kind of different junctures where people kind of pick up the phone and say, I need your help. So we're here to, to support them through that. And are you getting many queries at the moment or um, expressions of interest or people just dipping their toe for the first time and asking the question, well, you know, how does it work? Yeah, it's an interesting time. Obviously, it's very challenging for everyone and the, specifically the arts <clears throat> and music, the music industry as well. Um, we've had some successful projects online through, through throughout COVID. Um, now, it wouldn't be the same volume as usual um, because I think some people are maybe hesitant. Um, I think the, the power of asking for help and asking for funds for some people, they're more comfortable than others. Um, for others, it can depend on the network that they have and who they're going to identify as potential funders. So it's a very sensitive time, um, but I think there's there's definitely potential. People are coming to us. We had um, a really successful project recently, Finian. He, um, I don't know if he's watching, he said he might join. Um, he raised um, just over 5,000 euro for his vinyl album, and he was thinking about doing it before COVID, and he went ahead anyway. Um, and he was successful and he actually reached his target in, I think, 24 hours or 48 hours. There's a lot of goodwill out there um, at the moment. And that's great to hear. Um, <clears throat> well, OK, um, Michelle, we, we'll come back to you shortly, but I, I think it's time we got to uh, Luan and John. So, Luan, I just wanted to give you a quick intro as well. Um, Luan's, uh, of course, an award winning singer and songwriter and she signed her first deal at just 12 years of age, before later signing with Sony Music and Elton John, John's management company, 21st Artists. She's written and recorded with some of the world's most successful songwriters and producers, including Grammy Award-winning Bill Bottrell. Uh, he worked with Charles Crow and Michael Jackson and Prince and many others. She's worked with Billy Steinberg, who's worked with Madonna and Roy Orbison and other luminaries like that. And of course, uh, Luann released her fourth studio album recently, Never Say Goodbye, on the 7th of February earlier this year which isn't that long ago, but in some ways, the one it probably feels like a lifetime ago because the 7th of February, there's been quite a lot of water under the bridge since that. Um, uh, yeah, what's, what's it been like? Well, I was lucky because I had a little bit of a run just, you know, beforehand, before we went into lockdown. So I, I feel thankful for that. Um, and then it was really adjusting to try and do um, all my interviews at home on the phone and via Zoom um, and like for making videos and stuff like that. And um, that was, you know, it was tricky, but um, it definitely pushes you outside of your comfort zone. And, <laughs> you know, you get to do stuff that you never would have <laughs> thought of. But it, it has been challenging. Um, yeah, definitely. So in terms then of your album, it's fair to say that you would have uh, used Fundit to raise uh, money to fund the album. That's how it would have worked. 
yeah. Um, I had actually made the album um, and I had made it over a two year period. Um, so I had funded it myself um, and I had got it to the stage where it was mixed and mastered, but I knew I couldn't go any further and I needed to get funds and, and finances from somewhere. And I had thought over the years about um, crowdfunding um, and it's something that it was in my head um, that, you know, oh, I can't ask people for money. Um, and, and that was purely in my head. And, you know, I wish that I had have done crowdfunding years ago. Um, if I could give myself, me now, some advice <laughs> to younger me, that would have been um, to use crowdfunding because, you know, I've been asked a lot during interviews, why wait 10 years before my last album was released in 2010? Um, and the answer to that is, it was finances, finance, financially. Um, I had come out of, um, as, as you said, three record deals um, and a management contract with lawyers to pay, solicitors to pay. So I financed my independent album in 2010. Um, then in 2015, I released an EP and I went to the credit union uh, to get my loan. And as any tour musician knows, um, you need a good car to get around the country. Um, and so I went back to the credit union to top up my loan. And, and so when I came to this point where I had really struggled to make the album because I had used every penny that I had. Um, and then I thought, I'll go down the crowdfunding route because really I couldn't go back to the credit union again. And my experience with crowdfunding was just amazing from start to finish. Um, the whole process was so enjoyable. Michelle and the team were brilliant to work with. And, you know, like I said, once, once I got it into my head that I am not asking people for money, I am, I am asking them to pre-order a product, a product that I have worked hard at, that's my creation, that I have put my blood, sweat and tears into. And, you know, and I'm offering um, rewards, you know, really, really cool and good rewards. Um, and so, yeah, so, so that, was, that was the start of it anyway. Brilliant. And we'll dig a little bit deeper on sort of some of your hesitations and how you got across those and some of the kind of the each stage in the process in a moment. But again, I want to bring John Spillan in here as well. And much like Luan, you'll know all about John, but to give him uh, his, his intros and his dues, he's, of course, one of Ireland's most uh, preeminent uh, songwriters, uh, performers. Uh, he's a proud Cork man, of course. His songs have been covered by multiple people, including Christy Moore, Sharon Shannon, Sean Keane, and many more. Uh, and John, uh, like Luan, is going to be set to be releasing his his album in, in 2020, uh, is the plan, I think. Uh, his first independent album in 20 years, recorded in London with Pauline Scanlon and produced by John Reynolds. And it's inspired by his travels around Ireland. I'm right in saying that it is, the plan is to do it this year. I know plans are changing regularly, John, but that's the plan um, at the moment. Uh, thank you, Paddy. Um, we're going to put it back to next year as the latest. Ah, okay, uh, right, fair so enough. No, yeah. no, we're, we're talking um, of releasing in February uh, 2021. Very good. So how has it been going in terms of your own experiences, first of all, through this very strange time that we're all living through? Um, fine, thanks. Very well at the moment. I mean, I did take a bit of a dive at the start. And mm. I did find that I was, you know, I have to say, a bit traumatised by the, the knockdown. Um, I was in full flight in March, uh, shocked on the Gaelge, doing gigs in schools, and I had a lot of work uh, lined up, which was cancelled. But um, but no, very good, and I really enjoyed the downtime, and um, I'm lucky to live in a lovely place out in the country, and um, all good here. Thanks so much. And it's given you, I suppose, time as well to, to, to reflect on everything, I suppose, the music industry and uh, your own music and, and all that sort of stuff, which is, which is valuable time. John, talk to us about how you came to um, get involved with this crowdfunding and with Fundit. Uh, yes, well, uh, um, I made a number of records down the years. Um, I kind of got discovered and got signed to EMI Records when I turned 40. Uh, nearly <laughs> 20 years ago and I made like maybe 10 records with EMI and then um, I made one with Universal I made I paid for the last one myself I you know I'm all bits and pieces projects but at this time um, I went back to London and made a very you know um, high class um, record and my friend Pauline Scanlon had a positive experience with Fundit about three years ago for her album Gossamer and she found that um, 
she built a lovely community around the record and it went very well. And um, so she recommended me to do it. And so I did it. And um, she uh, showed me that there were various platforms with Funded.ie, she thought had the best, um, very good for um, making phone calls, ringing them up, asking them questions, friendly, um, user friendly. And so I did. And um, then I was still unsure of myself and I got somebody to run the campaign, um, Kira um, O'Leary Fitzpatrick, and um, she ran the campaign. And, um, you know, I don't have the social media skills to do that. And then I got help again from um, Alan Doherty, uh, who filmed a beautiful video for me. And um, so really, I think if everybody does what they're good at and gets the people to do the things that they're good at, <clears throat> you know, teamwork wins. So I had a very successful campaign. Thank you so much. And did you have any of the same hesitations that Luan would have had at the start? Because I know like it can be a bit of a leap for people to, especially Irish people to ask for yes. anything really. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it wasn't so much that I was afraid to ask because I, as Luan says, you're not asking, you're selling. But, yeah, yeah. but you know, you're, it's a pre-order situation. And I mean, you know, the album will be very high quality and it'll be very much value for money. You yeah, know? of course, of course. It's not, like it's not, a, it's not a knockdown. You know, it's a, it's a good price that they're getting. You know, um, with the rewards and um, Pauline Scanlon very much helped me with um, getting the rewards down to um, giving very good um, value for money and having lots of different kinds of awards. You know, you want something around the tenner mark, the twenty mark. She said you should have something around the thirty mark, fifty mark. You know that kind of way. So, um, so not, it's I wasn't reluctant about um, you know begging. But in any way, because I'm proud of the product, but I was reluctant that it would not go well, that I would not know what I was doing or how to do it well. And is that something like, again, I, I think it's important to address any stigma that might be there because you can very quickly like uh, dispel it and Luan has done that and you've done that. But like that word begging, it seems to me, that seems all wrong to me, even just to imagine, like, like you said, quality product, people are paying for what they get and they're getting good value. Yeah. But that was something, is it something that you've encountered or something that you're conscious of or is there any element to that, John? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've encountered it a few times and people saying, and um, I donated. And I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very <laughs> no, much, yeah. Uh, you've bought a really good, you know, thing which is worth far more than what you're getting it for, you know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's, just, yeah. Uh, it's a new thing for us. It is a new thing. Um, I, Michelle, I'll come back to you just in terms of that, like, and, and that sort of ad attitude, which is understandable too, because people, like John has said, are getting used to the idea and they're becoming accustomed to it. It's a form of patronage, really, isn't it, for artists, is that you support them um, and what they do, and you get in return, you get the art back. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the model that fund, Funded is. There are other models <clears> out there. There's GoFundMe, there's Kickstarter, there are various different platforms. And I suppose we are a rewards-based platform. We're also all or nothing. So if you don't reach your target, you don't get anything. And there is a fixed duration for your campaign. So you choose, it's basically by seven days, the maximum you can do is a 77 day campaign, which would be pretty long, I think for anyone. Um, but really it's about setting your target, setting a duration, and then setting yourself the goal and going out and asking people. Um, and I think what the guys were saying is just interesting, you know, in terms of, um, you know, having the confidence to, to sell the product. Um, it could be an album, it could be something else. Um, so as we're talking about music here, so it's, it's, it's the, the rewards are really, really important. And also it's kind of, different people have different price points. So you might have a person who just wants the album and you can put that in at a really, really attractive um, value. I'm not gonna say, or price if you want to say that, but you, could, you can have kind of money can't buy things as well that people will only be, ever be able to access through your funded project. They won't ever be able to get it in any other way, you know, if you're selling your album somewhere else. So it's kind of creating, um, experiences or things that are um, kind of compelling for people to not only <clears throat> buy your album, but also kind of, as, he, as John was saying there, you know, create a community and create um, a kind of a buzz around the, the album and what you're doing and your work. Okay. Um, I just want to remind again, everybody, we're, we're available for questions at any stage. It's, a, it's an open forum here. If you would like to ask a question on the bottom, along the bottom, you'll see on the Zoom, you'll see Q&A. 
and all you need to do is click on that, <clears throat> excuse me, and submit your question. And, and uh, we'll try to get through as many questions as possible as they come in. Um, we'll probably take questions if there are any in five minutes. I know we're still just getting stuck in and then we'll take the bulk of the questions at the end as well. So please do not be shy because uh, there's the opportunity to ask the questions and uh, obviously uh, um, the two guys are very well in answer and, and Michelle as well. So let's talk about rewards then. Luan, talk to us about the rewards that you chose, the tiers and, and why you chose them. Well, I think a good thing to do is to have a look at other people, you know, other artists who have had successful projects and look at what they're offering. And then, you know, think to yourself, okay, if I'm funding somebody's album, what would I like? And uh, what would I like as a, as a reward? Um, and I think, so make them as kind of interesting um, and as attractive as possible. Um, and when I originally submitted um, my, my project to the team, uh, I remember I had, um, I'd spent, you know, a few days working it out and, um, and I thought I was submitting, you know, a brilliant, <laughs> <laughs> a, a brilliant application um, and uh, and it was you know I needed the help and guidance from Shell and the team um, to tailor to tailor it um, before it went live um, and you know at the end of the day everybody's working towards the same goal I would I would say take advice from Michelle and everybody at the team because they know they know what makes a successful project and um, they've had all that experience and um, so once once I kind of realized um, uh, the, all those little changes was hugely beneficial to me having a successful project. Um, and one of those was was the, the rewards. Um, now I can't remember now, but I'd love to actually see side by side my original um, my original uh, fill out, maybe would you call it that, um, and and what I what I actually. Um, what went live then as my project because I think it'd be really interesting to see how I changed it and how I adapted it. Um, so rewards, I started with um, 10 euros that was for your, your download and I think that's very affordable for people. There's a lot of goodwill um, and you know like John was saying it's not a donation. I you know everyone gets a reward and I would want everybody to, to get a reward and I'd almost be offended you know when people said oh no I don't want anything you know I think well you know you're getting it <laughs> um so rewards that was 10 euro then the hard copy um so cd vinyl um I wanted to make my vinyl a little bit more attractive so I went for 180 milligram and I went white vinyl so it was um yeah I just thought that might be you know a nicer I uh, suppose item for people to have in their collection um, then I had um, video participation and uh, now unfortunately with with COVID that wasn't able to I wasn't able to do that in the way I wanted but what I did was I um, I got people to send me their little clips of them at home and, and I included all all those little clips in the video when when it happened uh, then another reward was to write an original song um, and record it professionally. Um, and I think to be mindful as well when you're doing something like that, because you know it, there could be very um, uh, topics maybe that people would find very personal, and and you might find that challenging to write. So you know if that's something that you're going to commit to, make sure you're 100% committed to that, and whatever you know that may entail. Um, so yeah, I would say have a look at other people's projects um, and think about what you want yourself, what you would want yourself. And, and also don't be afraid to reach out to other artists, you know, other artists who've been successful. Um, everybody's very accessible now, so drop them a message on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and you know, you never know, they might answer, you know. So I think that's, you know, to reach out and, and, um, and ask questions, you know. And John, from your own point of view there, obviously, um... I'm looking at your tears here and I think you had the guts of about 13 or four, maybe more 15 or 16 different tears. Uh, mm -hmm. How did you come to choose everything there from the, 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 the introductory tier, which is on 10 euros, which is the digital download for the new album, but, uh, and then all the way up to the more expensive tier. So how did you go about all that, John? Um, well, as I say, um, Pauline Scanlon and helped me a lot. And also the team at Fundit were extremely helpful. And, um, um, I named each t like the the um, the tenor deal is called the 100 Snow White Horses Reward, and I think you'd nearly pay uh, 10 euros for the name, and um, that you've got a, a reward called 100 Snow White Horses, uh, not to mind say a beautiful download of a of a you know a very fancy album. 
So um, I made up some rewards and Pauline said, we well, need something in at this point, you need something in at that point. And so, um, so someone who had done it before really helped me. And then we gave, I gave each uh, reward the name of a song, like the Oro Shedevahawalya Award. I go to your school and do a, an Irish language gig for the kids. Um, the Hit Factory Award, you know, all these kind of ones, the Princess Street Award, Dunstore's Girl Award. So it got longer and longer, but it's the more <laughs> the merrier, isn't it? Absolutely. And what was your own experiences of, of um, you know, like, because I think both yourself and Luan had, uh, you've, you've, you have a tier there where you're writing songs for people. And I can imagine she mentioned that, you know, there's, it, it can be, you can take on a project like that and it can be, that can be, um, you know, there can be a lot of different things to consider. But as a prolific, very prolific songwriter yourself, like how did you find that particular? Well, uh, that, was, that was the most challenging thing. Right. Right. I, I had a Hit Factory Award uh, reward where I would write you a song and uh, the price of that reward was 1,000 euros and I got five. Brilliant. And that was by far the biggest uh, reward. And um, of those five songs, three have now been completed by um, the end of July, seven months later. And um, they were extremely challenging. Um, one was a song called ABC... Um, the Association of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice. I wrote them a song. Um, one was for one was lovely, um, an anniversary for um, a surprise anniversary for for um, a guy in Philadelphia for his wife who loves the Star Constellations and the Rocky Mountains. And I wrote lovely. them a, a lot of Native American um, star myth mythology. It was the most beautiful project. And then the third one was for somebody who had lost their daughter who had passed away. Um, you know, at the age of 18, and it was a really sad situation and um, really tragic and beautiful. And I had to write that song, which is extremely challenging, but they, they loved the song. They loved the song. And I made the song up out of things that her, this uh, girl's, her classmates had written to her, you know. So I, I managed to put, remove myself from the situation a bit. And, um, and it's a happy song. So, um, I've got two to go, but one is for a, an animal rescue centre in West Cork, and I'm looking forward to that. We live dogs and cats, you know. And <laughs> yeah, of course. I can, I can do, I know I can do it. It can yeah, be yeah. fun. And um, then the fifth one is for a house in Dingle, and it's got a lot of history, and it involves a trip down there, which we can't go because of the COVID, <clears throat> but that's all put back. So, um, yeah, it's big work. And uh, if I sing and write a song for someone, like, I really have to write a song for, you know, mm. it's not just a side song. It has to be, you know, my next big song, you know. Of so, course, um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Cool. And, and a, a, great, a great gift to receive as a fan and a brilliant reward there, no doubt about it. Okay, look, at, I said we go to questions now and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some questions. There's plenty there. So I'll start with this one, which is in the chat, but it's from Mel Goodall. And he says, just released an album on the 1st of July. Um, is it too late to start a campaign to market it? Um, all monies spent, uh, uh, well, this is a very common one, all the monies were spent on making the album. Um, Lu Luan, because you'd spent uh, money on making the album and, and really your fund it was around uh, marketing and distribution and, and everything else involved. Would that be fair to say? Yep, 100%. Um, I needed money for manufacturing um, and for to give the album its its best possible chance and, and I felt you know it needed to be given its best possible chance and I needed to to be able to pay for PR and marketing um so yeah I mean that absolutely that's um yeah go for that because that was exactly what I did and and I wouldn't have been able to release the album I needed to get it over the line because making the album is only the first hurdle you know um getting it out there is that's that's the next one and um yeah, I mean, I think do out your budget and um, be a really re realistic in your goal and then make sure you use all your platforms um, every, you know, all your social me media platforms. Um, and then I, another little tip would be that um, when when I would post once a day, I would find, you know, there was interaction and then there would be nothing. So then I posted twice. And it was three times and every time I found okay this is working you know this is it, you, you get movement people pledge um so make it interesting you know don't just post and um, fun me fun me you know make little videos and um, and give them the progress this is where I am this is where I need to be with your help I'll be able to get my manufacturing um, costs I'll be able to put my PR campaign uh, strategy in place so let them know exactly what they're you know what they're paying for um so you know, if that makes sense. 
Absolutely. Michelle, anything you'd like to add there in terms of that, that kind of the timing around uh, marketing the, the album now it's released? Yeah, in terms of um, that question as well, like it depends if the album's already been released and essentially it's it's all released and out there and everything's done. Um, I suppose the, the funded campaign can't actually be used kind of retrospectively for those those costs and expenses. So it depends on what like what is the next stage and the next phase of that creative project. So it can be kind of sometimes for us kind of we have to like look at the projects in a little bit more detail before saying yes, you know, it's definitely eligible. And um, but in terms of if there are different phases of your project that you are trying to get to the next stage of it. Um, but in terms of, I suppose, monies can um, can be raised retrospectively to pay for stuff that's come before, if that makes sense. Um, so that's just a... <clears throat> what about if, if, um, if that person was to release singles, you know, if that was going to be the, the campaign for single releases from the album, would that work that way, Michelle? Um, yeah, that might. Yeah, I suppose it depends on, um, yeah, kind of looking at all the structure of everything and, and having a chat with them and figuring out where where the person's been and where they're where they're trying to get to. Okay, well, we'll move on because um, lots of questions coming in, which is brilliant. Thank you all so much. So Sean Fox asks, uh, hello, guys. Do you feel a funded campaign for a new emerging artist? Hang on, no, you still get my audio there. Um, okay, yeah, I think it broke off there. Second, I'll start again. Hey, guys, do you feel a, a funded campaign could work for a new emerging artist or is it better suited for someone who's already starting to get established? Um, I definitely think it's a great platform for emerging artists. Um, I think the key is to already have a following in terms of, um, you know, if, if you have a Facebook page or Instagram and you're, you're starting off and there's nobody on there, that's not a great time to do a funded project. But if you're an emerging artist and you've already started, um, you know, kind of building your community around you, um, and you can even start prepping them and saying, you know, kind of testing the idea that I'm going to be doing a crowdfunding project. And, um, you know, a lot of people I find they're, they're talking about it a lot before they, they actually launch it. Um, but it's definitely, we have a whole range of artists who would be using um, fundus from every, you know, every different art form. And it's not necessarily people who are established um, and, you know, with, with years and years of experience, it's, um, it can be, you know, people on, on either end of the spectrum. And as well, like I suppose, in terms of just to give a bit of context, like John, John raised over twenty-seven thousand euro, and uh, Luan raised around seven, seven thousand to seven thousand three hundred. So you know, we're kind of talking about different scales of projects and different scales of targets as well. So whereas for one person, two thousand five hundred might be what they need to get them, you know, to let's say an EP or something. Um, whereas for someone else, there's a massive um, project and you know, there's lots of different expenses. So it, it can really depend you know, on the individual as well. Mich Michelle, I think this is probably for you as well, but Brew in Barica asks, how strict is the limit? And if you don't reach your target, why do you lose everything? Or do you, do you have to lose everything? Um, so uh, I think that's probably, there's another few questions, but I think that's probably one to answer straight up. So how strict is the limit? Um, in terms of, um, I'm not sure what, the, I'm not sure about that part of the question. I think they're worried about having to go back and ask fans to spend, like reinvest or invest more in the, in the campaign. If they're not, if they're worried about not hitting their target, I, I presume. Yeah. So, so our model is all or nothing, and I suppose the the philosophy around that is that. If you budget for your project for a specific amount, let's say six thousand euro, if you only got three thousand euro, then the question is: Is that project going to be of quality um, when people were investing for a six thousand euro project? So that's really it's it's a it's just a model, and that's that's what we offer. Um, and I suppose it really comes down to your budgeting, being realistic about your budgeting, and being as granular as possible about who's going to fund my project and how much might they fund. And that's a process of actually sitting down, whether it's a piece of paper or your Google sheet or an Excel spreadsheet or however you like to work and getting as granular as possible to figure out um, how much money you think you can raise and what your budget is and where you can meet in the middle. Um, and that's something that, you know, we can chat through, but it's essentially it's really about your own specific project. I think the second part of this question is, uh, is a good jumping off point for the next topic of conversation because Brew asks, uh, how do I justify a campaign for a product when everybody seems to get music free digitally? 
And that is a fair question because obviously the challenge is that in ever since the music industry essentially uh, allowed allowed itself to be given away for free, there has been a huge challenge for artists in being able to find and source, um, you know, reliable income streams. Um, but I imagine from the pitch is all important. And again, Luan or, or, or John on this, like in terms of your own pitch and how you were talking to your fan base about it um, at a time when so much is free and available on Spotify or wherever else, what was your approach in that? Um, um, well, I, after you, you Luan. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, John. We'll go to Luan afterwards. Yeah, 100%. Sorry, um, excuse me. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. And um, I think that, interestingly, this is a way to sell records. You know, I mean, we look for ways to, 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 to get money back on the records that we make. And, um, you know, one of the ways is by making vinyl, which is popular now, or another way is to do live gigs and sell them at gigs. It's hard to get them into shops. But interestingly, the Funded.ie campaign is a, is a way of selling albums. So not only does it fund your, um, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah, like, absolutely. It's, um, it's, a, it's a way to sell music. So um, it has to be seen in a positive light. Yeah, it's adding value back into the physical product, John, isn't it? Well, I mean, uh, I'm still attached to the physical pro product because I'm old, but I mean, <laughs> music is virtual. Um, but um, so how to sell, how to get return from your, your music in this modern age of free music is to do a funded campaign. That's one of the ways. Yeah. Uh, you want? Yeah, and I think your your fan base would will generally want to support you. You know, they won't be downloading it for free, and um, and you know, and if they do, uh, then they're going to go and see a show. They're going to go to a live gig, and maybe they'll buy some merch at that. Um, so you know, unfortunately, that is that's the way the music industry is, and um, you know, all we can do is hope that music fans will continue to buy music. And, uh, and, and that's, that's how we, that's how we survive. Um, uh, lots of questions coming in. I'm going to stick with them because they're, <laughs> they're better than my questions. Uh, Roger Keller asks, and this is a good one because I think you'll both have a good, uh, kind of angle on this. How big should your fan base be to set up a successful crowdfunding campaign? Is that, a, how big is that consideration? Well, I think you know, that's where you have to pick a realistic goal. <clears throat> do out your budget, do exactly out, put out all your figures, what you need, make sure you add in like your postage and packaging um, so that you, you're covering all your costs. But, um, you know, even if you if you have a small fan base, reach out to the small fan base. And, mm -hmm. and you know, like Michelle was saying, there's various different um, goals. So, you know, I went for, I think I asked for 6,500. Um, but I ended up getting close to 8,000 and, you know, I couldn't believe it. I was blown away by that. Um, so, you know, just, yeah, reach out. And I think, you know, prior to your campaign, maybe you could do a little bit of groundwork and, um, and make sure that you're on everything, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, and, um, you know, maybe try and build your fan base as well beforehand. You could do, you know, a little bit of groundwork, even while you're making the album, you could be doing that. Uh, and then pick your realistic goal target, you know. What's your take on it, John? Um, could you ask me the question again, please? The, about the size of the fan base, John, and like, you know, yeah, like um, okay, how so, big the fan base needs to be to... Yeah, I don't know how you measure a, a fan base, you know. It, to me, it's a very ephemeral number, What the number of your fan base, you know. But um, I would say that, like... Um, one of the things that a funded campaign will do as well is it will build your fan base, you know? So, I mean, I don't think so much that you're waiting to get a big fan base, a certain number of a fan base before you do the funded. I think the funded will build it. And I think the funded, um, in my case, I think the, the funded video uh, was hugely important because I think it, it sold a lot of people on my music for the first time that hadn't been sold on it before, you know? So, um, so I think it's a very positive way of building a career. Um, I'll keep going with the questions here, guys. Uh, Pat Ryan asks, uh, Michelle, this might be one that you can possibly answer. Just, uh, he says it's more of an observation. Um, and he says, hi, Luan and John, Pat Ryan here and Claire, um, uh, up the banner. So 
it is very important. So is it very important to overachieve, as he says, if that's the correct expression? Um, so for somebody, if they're being on the money, it could be tricky for someone for whatever reason that they don't follow through in the financial commitment. Okay, so I see what he's saying there. He's saying, do you build in a little bit of a, some 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 kind of a uh, a buffer for maybe not everybody being able to deliver pay what they're what they've said they pay or how does it work michelle yeah so you're always going to have a small number of credit cards that will be declined so you have to factor in around maybe five percent um maybe up to eight percent um that's just that's just the nature of crowdfunding um sometimes um people will still honor those declined pay um I was going to say donations, but those um, declined pledges. It may be a case, um, you know, that they they used their um, their uh, their card, or they had a block on it for um, internet payments or something like that. So they have they can they can make that payment if it if it gets declined the first time. Um, but sometimes people don't follow through, and um, it can be disappointing. Um, but that's something that we track, um, you know, as part of, you know, of all of our tracking with it, with payments and everything that um, we would be tracking, like if there are, um, you know, a significant number of failed payments or, you know, from one person or something like that. So we, yeah, but they pay up front essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's not on delivery. It's, it's, it's up front when they, when they, when they uh, agree to, to buy whatever tier they're buying into. Yeah. So when you pledge, your card isn't charged. It gets charged when you're, when um, you get gotcha. the contract finishes. So things can happen in your credit card within that time. Yeah, absolutely. So, much, so you're factoring in 8% there or 5 to 8% of things, what you said. Okay. Daniel Paquette asks, um, he says, and this is a valid question and um, I'm sure it's something you probably considered yourselves, lads. Do either you feel like this model and I guess other models like it is turns um, you into a business person rather than an artist. Go on, what do you think of that? Um, well, as somebody who signed a first record deal at 12, um, I realized very quickly why it's called the music industry and <laughs> yeah. the music business. Um, and, you know, being an independent artist, you have to wear a lot of different hats. And sometimes it's very hard to juggle that. And there has been times in my life over, you know, over my career that I have almost forgotten that, oh my God, yeah, I do this because I love to sing and I love to write and I love to perform and I'm, and I'm a musician. Um, so it's, it's to find that balance. And, you know, you're 100% right with that question. But to be an independent artist, you have to take on a, a lot of roles. And what you get from that is being someone who has been signed um, and have, I, I, I mean, I had everything done for me and I didn't ask questions at times. Um, if I could do all that again, I would ask questions and and I would be much more proactive in the decision making. Um, you know, going down the funded route, you retain control of the, your product. So there's nobody telling you in the studio of what songs are going to be chosen, how to sing, what to wear when you're going out to promote it. So there's so many benefits to being, you know, having that control. Um, also, I think it's important that you have people around you that you trust, that you can you know that, that you're not making all these decisions for yourself because you can get a little bit bogged down in it. Um, and I, I would, um, you know, my day would usually be, you know, more it, it's structured like some mornings, emails, <laughs> you know, and then I, I will factor in time in to, to be creative. And sometimes that's difficult and I have to get away from it all. And when I, when I made this album, I took myself off to Inishbofin. And I had to, I just had to be away from the emails and, and the phone. And, you know, I needed to be on an island where there was no phone signal most of the time. Yeah, good <laughs> so, idea. It's a really good question. Um, but I think, you know, in today's music industry, you have <laughs> to wear, you have to wear a lot of different hats. And, and sometimes, you know, you have to keep your eye on the ball um, and sure. be involved in a lot of decision making yourself, you know. It's your Enjoy. career, you know. Absolutely, and John, you're from your point of view, you kind of mentioned that you you've you you uh, you rely on a few others to maybe take on some of those roles and and share the burden in that way. Um, yes, um, again, it's a it's a it's a big it's a good question, you know, about balancing your artistic self with your business self. But I mean, 
I mean, you can be a musician and be a songwriter and not be a business person at all and just don't do it. But if you want to make a living from music, you're going to have to be um, a business person or you're going to either yourself or someone's going to have to do it. And um, I'm, I like um, teamwork myself. So, um, you know, um, I've got, um, in fact, um, my, um, the person who ran my funded campaign, Kira, uh, did such an excellent job that she's now my manager. And we ran a successful funded campaign, and um, things are going well. So I, I believe in uh, in you know teamwork as much as possible. And um, I know it's difficult to be an artist and then to be a business person. It's the other side of the brain or something. But uh, you you got to do it, or someone's got to do it. Absolutely. Okay. And I'll Conroy or Michelle. Do you want to come in there? Sorry. Uh, just just say on that working with uh, Luan and, and John we're, we're two very different experiences from kind of moderation and, and support process as well because with Luan she was doing everything herself it was like really really intense I know she was like working like every single day and then with John it was talking to John but also talking to Kira and I think that you know there's someone else there as well so it was much more collaborative and um, kind of different experience for us as well so I think you know John said it earlier like do what you're good at if you need support for your video or you need support for um i think a very thing a lot of people if sometimes people are good at writing about other things but maybe not about themselves and um, so finding somebody that can help you with you know the messaging of your campaign is a really key part of any crowdfunding project just to have that messaging and um, so if you need support or an outside source for that um, or the kind of the visual communication, whether it's your images, your video, um, seek support, you know, um, from other people. Um, okay, well, loads of questions coming in, which is brilliant, and I'm just going to stick with them because I'd love to answer as many as possible. Niall Conroy asks, it's about vinyl, lads. He's saying that, like, sometimes it's hard to, to look for money when you've content out there again for free. That's coming back time and again. So he's saying, like, with, with vinyl, it's a kind of a way to put something physical into somebody's hand we'd love to have a real album in hand to offer. Um, what's your thoughts on that, um, John? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm all for it, you know. Um, I'm, I'm a bit cynical about the whole vinyl craze because my, my daughter buys only vinyl and listens to it on the worst record player you ever heard in your life and the sound quality is absolutely terrible, but it's cool, you know. So I'm, I'm a bit of a cynic, but I, I, I would like to um, say that we've only had recordings since 1888. It's a new thing. We've only had 160 years or whatever of recording. Thomas Edison recorded Mary Had a Little Lamb in, 19, in 1888. All the thousands of years of music and sound have dis before that don't exist at all. And in, during the course of recording, you know, um, we had the, the record craze. That's changed. Now we've got the, then we had the CDs. Now we've got the virtual music, you know, on the phone. So we don't know where it's going. So um, I think that the, the, the latest vinyl is just another way of holding on to... Music doesn't really exist. Um, yeah, you have to um, catch it in some kind of a net to transfer it from one you know, place mm. to another. And uh, I think vinyl is just fa another fascinating um, wave. Sorry, I'm talking too much. Oh, no, not at all, John. No, it's, it's a, well, that, that's, that sweep of history there is very interesting now. I actually yeah. read that recently or the other day that... Google are developing a chip to actually implant the music directly into your, into your, uh, I think it might be into your ear canal. So right. like a Black Mirror episode, um, it's very, uh, very dystopian, but, but uh, that could be the next thing. Um, what about yourself, Luan, on that particular question? Um, I think for vinyl for me makes me actually sit down and listen to an album as a whole now, where, you know, if I'm driving in my car or if I'm in, um, I'm inclined to, to flick, you know, um, and and when you make an album, you want it to be a story from start to finish. Um, and, you know, you want the, the listener to actually listen to the whole thing as, as a whole and as a package. And for me, vinyl does that because it makes me sit down. I'm not going to, you know, pick up the needle and, <laughs> and move it on. Um, and yeah, that, that, yeah, just, just with, with, with regards to vinyl for me now, that's, that, that, <laughs> that's what it does. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, an, it's just another idea for a reward. It's going to work for some people. Yeah. It won't work for others, you know, um, I, I presume. Yeah. Niall says, uh, he's the manager's last question, if, they, if you fund it, they will come. 
thanks for the enthusiasm <laughs> to just go for it like and set a target. <laughs> Very inspiring. Tagline well, for us, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, good stuff. Um, I'm going to keep going. Camille O'Sullivan. Uh, hi, Camille. Um, hope you're keeping well. She asks, great talk, everyone. Thanks a million. How much would be a good slash typical amount of money to raise for an album? So that can be a bit of, that could be a how long is a piece of string kind of a question. But Michelle, generally speaking, how, how do you advise? Yeah, it, it is that kind of um, question. But um, the average um, campaign on Funded at the moment is usually from around, is usually around, um, 6,000 to 8,000 euro. So that's kind of the average amount that people are, 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 are their target, but you know. They're, they're and is it typically uh, albums in that one, Michelle, or is that, is that yeah, all sorts of? Right. All of our, right. um, okay. all of our projects. We all of your projects, yeah. I don't know what the average is for music, actually. I, I don't have that to hand, but I would, I would hazard a guess that it's, it's probably somewhere around 7,000 euro. Um, but then you have people like John who skew that up, you know, by, by getting a, a lovely big chunk of, of um, you know, 26K. Um, I think it, it really does depend on, on your budgeting um, and the size of the project that you want to do. Um, but a lot of people, I think, are, you know, we have another project online, which is going for 11,000 euro at the moment. And Finian, who uh, raised, um, he did his album, his, he had raised around 5,000 euro. And that was during COVID for his, de um, for his final album. Um, she also asks, we also asks, lads, where did you go to engage your fan base? And this is a general question. And obviously your fan base is going to be important for engaging with them on Funded. Was it through Facebook? Twitter, mailing list, presume you both have very strong fan bases. The worry I would fear for myself is rejection of no one coming back. Oh, I wouldn't think so, Camille, but I have a good mailing list and Facebook, but still nervous of that and um, not great at social media and shy about asking. Well, I'm sure there are things that are you have to encounter at the start of this process. What's your approach, Luan? Um, use them all. Use every single platform that you have available right. to you. Okay. And and you know about rejection we all have that i was terrified when i started this campaign and it kind of almost not made me go with it because i thought if i don't reach my target you know that that's the end of it and i didn't think i would so go for it believe in yourself um and plug 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 <laughs> fair john what about yourself on that one i wonder is that camille sullivan the singer the famous i think it is singer? i think it oh, is, is yeah. It? Hi, camille. yeah originally from passage west uh, um, well, I mean, Camille, I mean, if it's you, I mean, or any Camille, um, you've got to go for it because, you know, um, whatever, you know, like there was, there was a story here in Cork, you know, these guys do music, um, these music courses, you know, for people who are on the dole and stuff like that. Like, and the teacher at the music course says, each one of you has a career in music. Sting has a career in music. You have a career in music. You know, let's, we're all... Uh, you know, we're all worthy of respect and we're all working away at our own, in our own field. And um, definitely, sure, Camila Sullivan, you'll have no bother. Like, <laughs> no. Famous, yeah. Absolutely. I, my advice would be, I'm a big planner. I love Excel spreadsheets and it sounds extremely boring, but plan, 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 plan everything more than you think you need to. Um, thinking about your delivery of your rewards right until the very end of it. Thinking about what types of rewards you could offer that um, might be just a bit unusual or unique. You might only have one or two of them that you'll offer because you can limit the amount of rewards that you offer. Um, but planning as much in advance, and um, you can come and talk to us as well. Um, but we, you know, we can we can really break down everything for you. The first submission that you submit to fund it, it's not going to be perfect. Um, you know, I I think it's better to just submit it, get chatting with us. Um, we can work on it and then you know when you revise you know which is what, what we did with both John and Luan um, it wasn't perfect perfect first time around um, but it's that kind of planning and thinking phase and um, that really kind of hones the project in um, and then you know also just planning your messaging having a really clear call to action for your funders so they understand what you're doing why you're doing it and how much you need to get there. Okay, spot on. And uh, Camille says, yep, it is. It's Camille from Passage West. So hi, hi to Camille. Camille. Hi, Camille. Uh, and, hi, Camille. And, uh, nice to have you along this evening. I should say as well, yes, Camille please. did an interview with Joe last year on all um, 
our my closing time and uh, it's a brilliant interview so do check it out it's on youtube and it's lovely to uh, see you back here again this evening camille now we'll move on and uh guys i'm going to try and pick up the pace because we still have loads of questions to answer fantastic interaction here just conscious of time we've only a few minutes left so michaela mcdonald asks is there a better time of year to launch a campaign than others and vice versa time of year that isn't the best for crowdfunding or does it matter Jesus, I think COVID has turned everything on its head in that regard. But anyway, Michelle, what do you advise? Um, yeah, again, it's 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 another it's a tricky question. Um, we would find um, if your project falls, um, like if your project is going to end in January, sometimes um, that part of the year can be a little bit quieter. But having said that, it's also a great time to promote and try and get people to um, pledge for kind of like a Christmas present. It can be like a, a delayed Christmas present or something like that. Um, so I, I think it's better to look at it the other way around. What's the best time of year for you and the actual plan that you have and where you're trying to get to um, and mapping that out. And then especially as well, if you're, if you were touring or if you have any other um, things lined up, just making sure that it's all kind of scheduled, um, you know, into that kind of calendar. Um, but um, there, it really, I think as well, it's, it's about how you're going to communicate to people as well. Um, sometimes the summer can be quieter because people are going on holidays, but um, it's not happening at the moment. So. Okay, and uh, we'll keep going. Daniel Dunnikan asks, can you do a crowdfunding campaign to fund the actual production of an album before it's produced? Um, well, that's, was that how it was for you, John? Like, is that how you would have, is that how you would have operated your funded? Um, he said, oh. the question is how to, for the production of an album before it's produced. Before it's produced, so yeah. So pre-production so, we're talking so, about. So, so to fund the production, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I would say yes. That was your, that was your experience, wasn't it, as such? You would well, have, I mean, my, did you, my, the, um, yeah. My, the, the, the money I raised is for a lot of things. Uh, yeah, it's for um, you know a lot of musicians, and it's a, it's for an album, but it's also for um, uh, artwork and marketing. It's for everything, really. The video as well, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, uh, I think that's the point as well. Like John, John's whole package, like his budget, was very large in terms of what he was raising his funds for. But some people will just do a very specific part. It might just be for um, mastering and you know production, or you know, there's the specific chunks of it. So um, yeah. It's, it, it can depend which part of the expenses that you're you're trying to fund as well. And you're talking to people and telling them where you're putting the money and explaining to them what where the money goes and that kind of thing, Michelle. Is not is not the approach. yeah. It's really important to be as transparent as possible with your funders yeah. as well. And um, they want to know where the money's going, and but they want to you know uh, they have this goodwill there and they want to see the finished product and and support you in that. Um, okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, we we'll just say. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Bianca Fachel says, Hi, all. Thanks for the webinar. What do you think about streamed live shows for funding campaigns, Michelle, and rewards adaptable to these current times? That's a good question. Yeah, like that, you, that you're setting up rewards that can be very much executed remotely. Yeah, I mean, it's everyone's kind of pivoting now online um, in terms of offering rewards. A lot of the time people are offering house concerts, tickets to concerts, tickets to gigs and things like that. Um, you know, I suppose if there's, you know, I suppose there has to be some sort of, sort of exclusivity because I suppose if you're going to do some type of live streaming concert that anyone can access, um, if somebody's funded your project, I suppose, where's the, where's the special feature that they're getting? So I suppose you probably need to consider um, if you're doing a live stream for your funders specifically, um, how, how are you just um, kind of, how does that differentiate from something that might be public to all of your fans? Okay. Um, flying through to now, Ender Riley asks, was press slash radio a large factor in spreading the word? Ah, okay. Or was it mainly through email lists and social media? I think I think you guys have kind of answered that and said it was out just blasting it out every which way you can, in terms of your social platforms and mailing lists and everything else. I guess if you can get press coverage for it and radio coverage, and you can mention it in pre press appearances and that, you it's a good one. But you mightn't get a press appearance. I think it's fair to say just based on your funded. You probably need something else to talk about as well. Would that maybe be fair to say? Radio, maybe local radio might be. I don't Claire, think you would. Yep. Yeah, if you want popped into your local radio station um, and got you know the your local community behind you. But in general, um, 
no, I wouldn't have had any national radio or anything like that. I don't know what John's experience was. Yes, um, I, I think that like uh, gimmicks go a long way and um, tricky um, ways of advertising. That's what advertising is all about. And I was lucky enough to say I, I had my hit, hit factory reward and um, some journalists picked up on it and they put a, a piece in the examiner. Brilliant. Saying, um, John Spillane will write you a song for 1,000 euros. And like the examiner <laughs> it's a good headline. Me. Yeah, you know, so... Um, yeah, yeah, it's a good well, headline. I had a very good, well, I had an excellent photograph by Eddie Hennessy and right. um, a, a very good journalist in, um, in Ellie Byrne. So right. I think that was quite catchy and that went around. And the five pledges that I got pro probably came from that um, piece of journalism. Yeah. And I, really I, would say, in the I would say on that, um, sorry, I would say on that, like the hook, if you're pitching into press or media, the hook can't just be that you're crowdfunding for your project. Like that's yeah. old news at this stage. Um, it has there has to be the story. What what is the other story? Or like John was saying, you know, there's a there was a um, something a kind of novelty factor there. Okay, and uh, just final question then, and we'll have final thoughts then. We're we're all wrapped up, but uh, it's uh, has previous campaigns given you a feel for what's the most successful time limit in the past? So Michelle, this is for you. Have shorter, well planned campaigns proven to be more successful than a more drawn out time limit that ends up risking that loss of momentum. Yeah, Brian and Cook asked that. You said it right there, kind of the word momentum. Like I would say there's, there's two sides to us. Number one, especially if you're doing it on your own, you have to think of your own motivation and your own motivate, uh, kind of momentum for pushing a project. Like anecdotally, people would spend two to three hours a day working on their funded campaign while it's live. So I would usually recommend around six to eight weeks um, would be kind of, the average um, for a funded campaign. I, I personally think like five or six weeks works really, really well if you're really, really prepared before you go live. Um, and it's enough time in terms of actually getting the message out. You'll get a peak in your funding. It'll start going down and you'll probably start freaking out. And then, you know, you kind of sit down, have a think about things and then it'll go back up at the end. So there is kind of a bit of a, a curve in terms of how your, your funding will come in as well. Um, so. The, some people do have a reason that they're going to do a longer campaign and um, it might be to do with some type of press or something like that and um, so it's it's not as it, it but I think it has to be kind of strategic and kind of thought out process of well I'm doing it for 10 weeks because x y and z okay well look we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time but before we go uh Luan just any final thoughts in terms of your own experiences of the, the entire campaign the process well, I, I have to say I enjoyed it thoroughly from start to finish. Um, um, just uh, as Michelle said, plan, plan, plan. Um, uh, pick a realistic goal, um, as we had said before, and and then just and don't be afraid, don't be ashamed. Um, you know, you're you're not asking for money. You are pre-selling a product, and as John said, it's a great way of selling a product. And um, so, oh, brilliant. I couldn't say enough amazing things about Fundit. It's, it's a brilliant way to, to sell an album. And especially in today's music industry where, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough, it's a hard sell at the moment. But I think especially now there's a lot of goodwill out there for musicians because it's, it is such a tough time for us. Um, so there's a lot of goodwill. Absolutely. A good time for patronage for sure. Uh, John, from your own side, any final thoughts on the process? Um, yeah, I, I found it very positive and I'd like to thank um, Fundit.ie and thank everyone and, you know, who, who helped me. Um, Kira O'Leary Fitzpatrick, Pauline Scanlon, Alan Doherty, Ellie Byrne and everyone who helped me. And uh, I, um, as, so I think it was very good. I think that you need to get people who are good at social media, who really understand it. You know, um, you, you know some people know you do this on a Friday, you do this on a Monday morning. You do, I wouldn't have those skills at all. So I think you, should, you need help to get somebody who's good at that. I think the video is very, very important. As a final point, I think because the video is, is going to what draws people in. So I think you should get, don't do it yourself, you know, get someone to do it. And um, I think that it's, um, it was very positive for me. And there's over 400 people and have pledged and I've corresponded with all of them since then. And um, yeah, I t thoroughly recommend it for anyone at any stage of their career, really. Good man. And uh, before we go, Michelle, thank you as well to um, Proponent All Together and to Imro, I should say as well. 
Thanks uh, thank you so questions. much to Luan and to John. Uh, and just to say with the two lads, you, you're, you can still, um, can, I'm right in saying you can still pledge uh, to your pages at the moment to pre-order on the, uh, no, no, not, no, you can't. Uh, in, in my case, <laughs> you can pre-order my album from my, my website. There yes. you go. That's it. Yeah. That's what it was looking yeah. for. And you can order my album from the website. <laughs> so, so go on, give us a plug on that, Luan. What's the website? <laughs> It's LuanParl.com. <laughs> Easily done, and you can pre-order there, and uh, or even not pre-order, you can order the album there. And John, <laughs> um, uh, John Spillane.ie, and you can pre-order the album, which we order uh, next year. One hundred Snow White Horses, most beautiful, beautiful album. Yeah, and a beautiful <laughs> title, and uh, yeah, no look, just encourage you to go and support two great Irish artists. An absolute pleasure talking to them both, and I'm seeing lots of people here saying thanks very much for a great evening, and I'd, I would echo that as well. Short and really informative, so it's. A it was a really good format as well and um well i think it went off quite well so i'm happy enough with that and we'll say good night i think michelle is going to end this recording now and uh have Great. a nice have Thanks, a nice buddy. end yeah good luck lads take it easy Thank thanks you. so much john john